Live from the 607 is the ODPH Entertainment Edition, where we're talking movies, comics, TV, and more. Why don't you join in the conversation? Hashtag ODPH, because here we go. And welcome to another edition of the ODPH Entertainment Edition. I'm your host, Ken M. Sitting across from me this week is the one and only Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Folks, we have a lot to recap concerning San Diego Comic-Con. Yeah, San Diego Comic-Con, while we said last week, is if there's something you enjoy, something you're looking forward to, odds are it's going to be there. Boy, did they give us a lot of stuff. They gave us a lot to talk about, so most of the show is going to be devoted to breaking down the good, the bad, and the hmm? And the huh? Ah? Yes. Of San Diego Comic Con, along with your normal movie, TV, and comic talk that we do here. Hashtag ODPHEE if you're joining us on the social media conversation because we want to hear from you. So, Pad, overall, what did you think of San Diego Comic Con? I really enjoyed it. There, You know, there's a couple of years where stuff will come out and I'll get really excited. And then there's kind of a lull. Mm-hmm. You know, there's kind of an all right. There's stuff that, like... It piques my interest, but it doesn't get me genuinely excited. For me, this felt like from start to finish, while there were lulls just because there wasn't really panels going on, it felt like every major thing that was getting announced or shown in some cases got me real amped up for it. And there was even some stuff that I had no idea was coming that I'm excited for. There definitely was a lot going on that really was keeping my attention all four days, Mm -hmm. which is very tough to do because there's just so much. It, usually by Sunday, you're just kind of burnt out, really, of right. just so much coverage. And especially the job the DC Comics did, which by Ooh. far and away, they won San Diego Comic-Con. Yes. This is not even a question. I would say there are some. Now, I will say there are. there's one thing Marvel announced for their comics line that I am kind of excited for, that being uh, Spider-Geddon. Yeah, we're going to get to that just in a little bit. But overall, though, looking at how DC made their imprint, on San Diego Comic-Con. We've talked in previous episodes, Marvel was not doing a panel at Hall H. Nope. They were kind of focusing more so on their Netflix and their comic line, which was great. They had some great announcements. But DC really took advantage of this. Right. The only real thing you had, excuse me, from the MCU per se, was you had one panel that was uh, concept art. It was all the concept artists who've worked on Marvel movies over the years. And the interesting thing to come out of this was that uh, it was revealed for the first time, as far as I can tell, that they were showing concept art for Black Panther that was being developed in 2011. Yeah. So before the first Avengers movie, they were already kind of fleshing out ideas for what they do in a Black Panther movie, which is insane. Marvel is so ahead of the game that when we hear about Phase 4 and and such, they're already working on Phases 5, 6, and 7, yep. as far as I'm concerned. Yep. And then the other thing they did was they did a props panel of sorts where they showed off... They showed off uh, The Infinity Gauntlet that Josh Brolin wore during filming, they showed off uh, Thor's hammer Stormbreaker that he used during the movie. Uh, Interesting note about that, it weighs 75 pounds. Really? Yeah, it weighs 75 pounds, and when he wasn't using it in set, some of the prop people or set people had to like stand there and put it on their shoulders so he could they could help hold the darn thing. (laughs) Uh, You got a complimentary bruise that went with it. So going into that, we're going to break down San Diego Comic-Con into three segments. The movies will be the first one. TV will be second. Comics will be third. And our one-shots will be just basically any fallout that we missed informing you in those segments. So going into the movie section, like we said, I thought DC really won Comic-Con. Yes. And they definitely made their stamp on San Diego Comic-Con with their movie premieres with Aquaman and Shazam. Holy moly. And I've got to say, Aquaman definitely lived up to the hype. Yes, that we've been hearing for a while that Aquaman has been is going to surprise a lot of people. It's going to be a real sleeper that it's flying maybe under some radars. I yes, no, no, it's not flying under some radars. It's flying under radars just for the simple fact that it's a DC movie. And while I admit I do enjoy some of the DC movies that have come out, some that even some people don't like. No, I don't love them, but I enjoy them. It's a DC movie, so there is that inherent, like, oh, it's a DC movie. This is probably going to suck. That has the reputation. I mean, unfortunately, for the direction they've gone with the formerly known as DCEU, but is yeah. now it's now changed to Worlds of DC. Yeah, good luck getting anyone to use that title. Yeah, it's going to be kind of a little hard transition, I think, for a yes. lot of people. But 
we're going to roll with it anyway. So for the worlds of DC, this has kind of been a very under the radar with Aquaman that there's been so much hype, I guess. And some people think let down with Justice League and yeah. obviously Batman versus Superman. Mm-hmm. That for Aquaman to succeed, it's going to take a lot to pull off. Right, because there was there were high expectations for both Batman v Superman and then Justice League because it was the first time in live action mm-hmm. that you had Batman and Superman and Wonder Woman on screen together. Right. That, that had never happened before. No, first time you had the DC Trinity. You had the you had the big three. Then you look at Justice League, first time on the big screen in live action that you had the Justice League together. That is on par in comic book fan minds as the as having the Avengers on screen together. Like it's it's as big. You know if not bigger because if, if it's not bigger. Justice League is the original super team. Right. So, but I think the the exciting thing with this is it looks good. It looks like, yeah, it's a little gritty. It's got that grittiness to it. It's got that rough around the edges kind of look to it. But that comes with, you know, Aquaman's history and what they're doing with it. But then it also looks like it's fun because you look at the end of the trailer where they're flying in a in a cargo plane. It looks like something out of one of the Indiana Jones movies. And this is, seems like a scene out of the Indiana Jones movie, if, I'm, if, if I can be honest, where... Mara jumps out of the plane and the pilot kind of looks back and goes, wait a minute, did she just jump out without a parachute? And without missing a beat, uh, Jason Momoa just goes, redheads, gotta love them. And he goes without one himself and he just goes flying through the air ch- screaming woo. You know, that's the one thing about Jason Momoa being Aquaman, that it's going to be a different take than the one we've seen in the comics. Mm-hmm. Usually in the comics, and especially with the Jeff Johns run, you've seen him kind of evolve into, I don't want to say from being a joke into a bona fide superhero. He always has been if he's been written well. Right, which the thing with this movie, for those who don't know, this movie is borrowing heavily, like exclusively from the Jeff Johns New 52 run. And if you haven't read the Jeff Johns 52, it is amazing. It is one of the best runs I don't know if the sale is still going. I know over the weekend, Comicsology was running a, I think it was like a buy one, get one on DC stuff. So you can possibly, if that sale is still going, pick up the Jeff Johns run. Yeah, definitely check out your local comic book shops and go see about getting the trade paperback. It is well worth the read. Mm-hmm. And you can definitely tell that the influence is there with Jeff Johns. Just how, I don't want to say he was lighthearted, but it was not as so serious as Aquaman has been written in the past. Right, and I know people are making some comparisons to, I think it was Robert Downey Jr. when... Uh, Mama goes to get on the submarine or whatever it is. He goes, "Oh, permission to come, permission to come aboard." And people were drawing comparisons to the line, uh, "Daddy's got to go to work." Yeah, and I know that it's kind of a good take for them to inst- instill some humor mm-hmm. into the DCU or worlds of DC. It's going to take a while again. You said, "Sorry about that, folks." But there was enough in there in the trailer that it made me go, "Okay, I like the direction it's going." Yeah, you definitely saw his. They're going to do his origin story, and you. Definitely saw the influence of the New 52 because of the villains that were being used. There was Oc- or Ocean Master, there was Black Manta, there was the Trench, which is great to see on screen. But my only fear, and mm-hmm. I guess the only thing that I would say I worry about with this movie is, is it going to be too much too soon? Meaning you have three major antagonists all in the same film. Mm-hmm. Which typically in the past... Uh, you have three antagonists in a movie, it doesn't do well. No, because you don't have enough time to flesh out everybody's backstory. Right. And really connect why they're doing what they're doing. Right. Aquaman, we don't know exactly how that's going to play out just yet. I think it'll work out fine in this case. I think there's enough history over the course, you know, there's enough history with comic book movies doing three villains that they can look at what the, what's come before them and kind of avoid the entrapments that come with three villains in a movie. Because the thing with the this panel was while the world and the panel saw the trailer that was released, the panel got to see an exclusive six-minute trailer that, from everything I've read, sold everybody on the movie. Yeah, I, there's a lot to like about the trailer. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it was bad by any means. I said The only thing that I'm just taking away from it is there's a lot going on that I right. just hope they're giving enough equal time to really flesh out because I don't want to see them try doing so much to get Aquaman over mm-hmm. as a prominent figure in the worlds of DC universe that they're taking away from the story. I would much rather them have one major antagonist in there and flesh their story out sure. to really connect with them instead of you're really going to try pushing the whole uh, rivalry with Ocean Master. Then you're going to explain Black Manta's story. And now you're throwing in the trench. That's a lot going on. What if they're all working together? What if it's not three people separately? What if it's all working together as one big triumvirate? 
that would be something. It's not to say it's not happening. Like I said, I didn't even think about that. But I'm sitting there just watching the trailer going, okay, well, I definitely like how every character is looking. Uh, the, visually, it looks amazing. Yeah. They really took the time to make Atlantis into, it seemed like a magical place. Yeah. And they really need to sell that as being why it's so important that being the king of Atlantis means something. Mm-hmm. And going into it, I mean, there was kind of maybe a little Game of Thrones vibe. Yeah, a little bit. With, with Ocean Master and, and, and dealing with the whole who is the true king of Atlantis and now declaring war in the surface world. I was thinking I was thinking more uh, Black Panther with the whole who's the true king. Well, there's that too. There's a lot of different elements going on that I'm just hoping that it pans out. Now, everything I saw, I definitely liked. I liked the special effects so far. I know the only thing I've been hearing criticism online about is Mara's hair, mm. which honestly, if that's the worst thing that's in this movie, I can deal with. Well, I know I saw uh, a couple people kind of complain about the way the visual effects look, to which I say uh, it's a movie that comes out in December and it's only July. Yeah, there's a there, lot there's, of work they're going to be doing. There's still work they got to be do, there's, uh, doing. They're still going to be doing a lot of work, but overall to get excited for the film, sold. Yeah. Definitely there. And, in fact, the scene that you were talking about, them jumping out of the plane into the desert, is it possible it's Kandahar, and this might be an introduction to Dwayne the Rock Johnson's Black Adam? Ooh, that could be. I'm going to just throw that out there right now. That, Let me know on social be media. That hell of an Easter egg. Hashtag ODPHEE if you think yes or you think no, you're completely off base because he was featured in Shazam, which is a great segue. Ah, See what I did there? Yes. That was probably the biggest surprise of Comic-Con, I yes. would say. Because I know even we said last week we weren't sure how they were going to do this movie because you look at the DC movie lineup as it stands, dark and gritty. You can't exactly do a dark and gritty Shazam Shazam movie. No way. But it's dark and gritty, but it's dark and gritty in that he's an orphan who's been kicked out of every foster home he's been sent to. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're Bruce Wayne. You're not going to be, you know, smooth around the edges if that's the case. No, definitely not. And there's enough of the child angst, if you will, right. that they're demonstrating. And they did enough just to give a basic once over concerning his character. Right. And I know I was talking to a friend today about it and they were like, well, you know, what are they? Are they trying to DC trying to copy Marvel? And I told him, yeah, not so much. I mean, I said, the thing of it is, is you can make it dark and gritty to a extent with the backstory. But the thing you got to remember is it's a 10-year-old with superpowers. You're not going to get a straight face truth, justice in the American way. You're going to get a guy cracking jokes. Yeah, and that's what you want to see from the movie. I, I guess the basic equivalent I got, I got the same feeling I got when I saw Ant-Man for the first time. Okay. That I really sat and go, okay, this is going to be a fun movie. This is going to be interesting to see how this plays out because for Shazam – who has had, I guess, kind of an interesting history uh-huh. involving the DC, DCU, because I'll just say comic book-wise, that he's one of the most powerful figures in all of the DC. Yep. You. Has he been written the best over the years? No. Nah. Yes or no? Jeff Johns has done an amazing job when he was writing him in the comics, but seeing him, uh, he's not really on the Justice League. He kind of does his own thing. There's really just a lot of different things going on that I don't know if he's really had his true prominence. Right, and if you go up to any co- comic book fan or any, you know, not necessarily the diehard ones because the diehard ones might actually say it the same, but you go, give me your top 10 or even top 15 DC superheroes. He might not even crack the list. No, he well, he probably will crack the 15, but definitely not top 10. No. Because if you talk to m- casual fans... Hardcore fans, yeah, you're going to know him because, I mean, for me, his greatest comic role was in Kingdom Come, mm-hmm. which you've, if you haven't read that story, that is one of the best written and illustrated DC stories you'll ever read. And you see the true power of Shazam involved in there. Yeah. Now, Shazam is always kind of a little different because there's a little magical element to him, and I, his history is always just very interesting to see. So see how it's going to play out is going to be kind of fun to watch. And they gave you a little teaser because they didn't go too much into Dr. No. Savania, um, the, who's the major antagonist in the film. So there's a lot of stuff they left on the table, which I like. Yes. Because I really don't know what to expect of this, except I just think it's going to be a fun movie. Mm-hmm. And for the worlds of DC Universe, I need to see that. Yes. I don't need to have everything dark and gritty. Why'd you say Martha? Exactly. I I don't need that. 
I want to go and be entertained and say, you know what? You made a Shazam film work. Okay. Which is the same thing you were saying before Ant-Man. Exactly. See, Shazam, I would figure I would see way before Ant-Man. Like when you're telling me about heroes, I would see in a a feature film. Ant-Man is really nowhere near that list at all. But Shazam, yeah, I could because he does have a history with the DCU. And to see him done well and see it actually come off on screen, you know, where it's passable to a mainstream audience. Yeah. That's the real test. Now, if they follow a lot of what Jeff Johns is right, and I know we, we reference Jeff Johns a lot, but if you've ever read his work, you know why. He takes very detailed time with each character in each project he does and really takes ones that maybe have flown under the radar and really elevates their status. I know that he's actually been announced to be working on a new Shazam comic book coming out. Oh, okay. So it will be coinciding with this, which will be really interesting to see how the take is. Now, I I think originally it was supposed to be Gary Frank was going to be doing the artwork on it, but he's working on Doomsday Clock. And if you know anything about that story, there is no other bigger project right now for DC than that one. Mm Mm-hmm. So nobody's leaving that book anytime soon. But going into it uh, in final closing for Shazam, I'm very happy with what I saw. Yes. I definitely think there's a lot to go on um, to make me really get amped up for the movie as you know more trailers are coming out. And just seeing you know Zachary Levy's definitely looks the role of Shazam. Yeah. And I think he's going to be great. Mark Strong is going to be awesome as Dr. Savania. And I just think this is going to be a win-win for DC. Oh, absolutely. It looks like it. It definitely is. And we didn't see any footage from Wonder Woman 84, but we heard about it. Everything is sounding like that's going to be another big hit. Yeah. DC is making the most of Marvel not being at Hall H this year, and they definitely won overall for the movies. Now, there were some other movie trailers that came out, that one of which that really impacted just as much as DC, should I say. Godzilla. Oh, my goodness. The King of Monsters. Holy moly. Now, after the last one that happened a few years ago, I know there was kind of a mixed reaction, I guess, from some people. Like, I loved it, the one with Brian Cranston. In right. It. This one definitely felt more, do I say mainstream? Do I say more traditional? Uh, tra- it feels traditional, and I like this trailer better than I did for any of the ones with the original one because... While they hint at kind of what's going on in this movie, they really don't give you anything. No, they didn't. The only thing, unless you really follow Godzilla, is you knew some of the other monsters involved. Right. I mean, which, I mean, they telegraphed that at the end of the uh, the first one. Yes. But this really drove the point home. I mean, just looking at the lineup they had for Godzilla, that it really made it feel as if this was the Godzilla film that they, we've been waiting forever for. Mm-hmm. It's not just your simple, he shows up in a city, destroys a city, some hero or heroine shows up and stops him, and that's the end. No, it definitely, you saw glimpses of Mothra, Rodan, King Ghidorah. You definitely saw enough that if you were a true Godzilla fan and monster movie fan, there was something there for you. Mm-hmm. And you kind of felt like there was the whole big action, big earth-ending event happening mm-hmm. that really sold what Godzilla should be. It shouldn't just be just destroying uh, Tokyo. It should just right. be him, you know, if you're going to look at him as like, do I say an anti-hero? I don't think that's, eh, that's It's hard true. to say. It depends on what take they do with it for uh, the movie. But I think that this is going to be one that he's now trying to help save people. I mean, just kind of get back to the core essence of Godzilla being the monster that is the king of all monsters. Yeah. And and I don't know if there's going to be any tie-in to King Kong or anything like that. There will probably be a reference. I'd like to see there, one. There will be something, I'm Not, sure. I think my favorite thing about the trailer, while I did enjoy all the action and the glimpses and everything, uh, being the musically-minded person I am, I enjoyed the fact that whoever put the trailer together decided to put the song Claire de Lune over it, which if you don't know that song or it sounds the song sounds familiar, uh, it's the same song. It's a famous classical piece but they uh most the one that immediately comes to my mind they used it at the end of the uh oceans 11 movie with uh george clooney where they're kind of all looking over the fountain in vegas and that's playing in the background so if you've seen that that's where it sounds familiar but i saw uh star wars the last jedi director ryan johnson tweet and i have to agree with him whoever made that decision uh should get a nobel prize oh absolutely i mean the whole trailer in in itself looked amazing 
and it really got me more excited to go see a Godzilla yeah. film than I already was thinking because there's it's been so long since the last Godzilla film, right? That I I know that a lot of mainstream public reaction has kind of been like eh, another Why, one. Why'd you take so long? Yeah, exactly. But if there if it lives up to the trailer hype, I'm sold. Mm-hmm. I'm all in. No questions asked. Right. So I'm definitely excited to see that. And the last trailer that I saw that I'm really, really excited to hear about had to be Glass. Okay. Now, the M. Night Shyamalan, I, now it's going to be a trilogy between Unbreakable and Split. It looked great. Now, I've, I've always been very hit or miss with Shyamalan's work. Mm-hmm. That I, I, I loved Unbreakable. Some of his other stuff, I have nothing nice to say about. Yeah. This looked like a modern day comic book. Okay. And it just had the feel of it. And it ties in so well to Unbreakable. Like, I just treat it like as a true sequel. Split is interesting in its own right. If you haven't seen it, James McAvoy does an amazing job balancing out 21 different personalities. Right. And he brings it to this film as well. So he is, I want to say, like the other antagonist in the film. And it's just really interesting to see how it plays out. But there was enough in it that it reminded me why Unbreakable worked in the first place. Mm -hmm. That unlike Kick Ass. This is probably the closest to a realistic superhero movie you're going to see. Now, Kick-Ass is a whole different story. But this, you saw that there are certain people that have powers, and they're trying to explain it to the real world. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing how it interacts and just kind of goes inside from there. There's a lot going on with it that I think, okay, they showed enough, but they didn't show everything. Right. And I think that really helps this film. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely excited to see it. And for the trailers, I mean, that's the only ones we saw. I know we heard about Venom. Yep. The Venom is not going to be tied into the MCU. Right. They officially, after that was confirmed in the Entertainment Weekly article, that was confirmed in panel. That's the reason you also don't see the spider logo on his chest. No, that they're going to try doing their own thing. But the Venom footage that we have heard about looked amazing. Right. And, of course, the uh, director did not rule out the possibility of seeing Venom and Spidey together at some point in another movie. Just for this one, no. No, this one is going to be self-contained. There were other symbiotes Mm -hmm. that were shown, so this is going to tie definitely into the storyline of... Say there's one people are crossing their fingers for. Yes, there has been no carnage as of yet. Keyword, yet. But there is heavily rumored there is an Easter egg somewhere in the film that's setting that up. And odds are I'm going to have to read and see what it is in an article because I'll miss it. Yes. I will. If I see it at the theaters, I will be letting probably everybody know because I will mark out. And I'm just very excited to see how that film is going to play out. That's going to be coming out of the week of New York Comic Con. Ooh. So there definitely be some more hype going into that as we're yeah. getting into October. But overall, I thought the movies that were released for trailers – Oh, just did a fantastic job about selling the movies. Right. And I think DC won. No, oh, yeah. I think the other one that stood out for me was the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them 2 trailer. That one for me is growing up as a Harry Potter fan. That one was very exciting to see. It was cool. It kind of hinted at more of the story, you know, with Grindelwald, you know, being on trial. And then he, he it looks like he escapes and Dumbledore goes to uh, Newt Scamander and tells him, listen, I can't be the one to hunt him. You know, you've got to be, which anyone who knows Harry Potter history knows why Dumbledore is saying he can't go after Grindelwald. If you don't, I'm not going to spoil it for you. Uh, But the thing that kind of threw me the most was the end shot of the trailer where Newt and his buddy are are meeting this elderly, frail gentleman who just looks like the next gust of wind could blow him over and kill him over. When you find out, oh, that's Nicholas Flamel, the big character from the uh, very first Harry Potter book, who, of course, was the only known maker of the Sorcerer's Stone. And I love the one line where he goes to him and uh, you don't look a day over 375. Yeah. But that one it really excited me. There's so many good trailers coming out of Comic-Con. We thought that Aquaman and Shazam tied for the best, but let us know what you think. Hashtag ODPHE. What trailers did you see coming out of San Diego Comic-Con that really sold you or really turned you off? We want to know. Hashtag ODPHEE. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, I'm Mike Pappy from Rye Bread, and you're listening to the ODPH. Hey. 
Coming back for our San Diego Comic-Con recap here on the ODPH Entertainment Edition, and we got to break down the TV news. I'll say, because TV was not to be outdone by the movies. Absolutely not. Now, the biggest TV panel of Comic-Con had to be The Walking Dead. Yeah, there was kind of a little bit of an elephant, or should I say walker, in the room. Absolutely. With Andrew Lincoln's announcement that he would be leaving the show, Mm -hmm. there was a lot of invested interest. Yeah, and if memory serves, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I saw a clip where it was in the middle of it. I think they were getting ready to go into a Q&A or they were in the middle of a Q&A. And he basically goes, listen, uh, I, I don't remember his exact quote, so I won't try to even uh, re-say it. But essentially he was like, you know, I know a lot of you are going to hear for Q&As. And there's one in particular that I imagine, you know, the news of it has been on the Internet for a couple of weeks now that you're all going to ask about. Is that true? And the entire room goes, Yes. Yeah, which it needed to get addressed, and I'm, how he answered it I thought was very interesting because, mm-hmm. I, to quote what he said, I love this show. It means everything to me. My relationship with Mr. Grimes is far from over. So what does that mean in general? Uh, to me, reading it on the surface uh, or possibly looking into it slightly, it sounds like should the show go on, and I personally have stated before I don't think it will. I think it will go through season 10, and that will be the end of it. But I think it reads, should the show go on, he might take a hiatus. He might be gone for a while and then come back because he says, my time is not done, which, okay, yes, you could read that as, well, the show's not done. He's got more to film. I think that also could mean, if should the show go on, he might come back, take a hiatus and come back. This is possible. I, I just don't think he's going to come back. I think he's always going to be connected and will be somewhat in like an ambassador role Mm -hmm. of The Walking Dead because, I mean, let's face it, you've been the lead actor on one of the biggest shows in television history. I'll say he's in the same conversation as folks like Robert Downey Jr. is attached to Tony Stark. Mark Hamill is attached to Luke Skywalker. Mm -hmm. You know, Kevin Conroy is attached to Batman. Andrew Lincoln will forever be attached to The Walking Dead. Yeah, and he's definitely going to represent the brand and really his body of work in that has really elevated the show. Yeah. Because obviously if your lead character doesn't deliver and really capture audience's attention, you're never going to get anywhere. No, this show would have ended years ago. It definitely would have. And as they start going into it, I mean, he did say the story is, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, that the story is bigger than his one character Mm -hmm. and it's still something definitely to check out. And they did show us a trailer for the upcoming season. That was longer than I expected it to be. It definitely was Holy longer, moly. and there was a lot going on. There was a few things that were confirmed mm-hmm. that I really thought was telling, and it did throw one of my theories off, which okay. it does happen. When they're showing the trailer, they were showing that this is now a time jump since All Out War has ended. Right. That there's now... Let's say, correct me if I'm wrong, the little girl you see running through the field at one point is Judith. I believe so. At least that's how I took it. Yes. I believe that it was Judith, and you see that they're rebuilding everything along the lines of you know, trying to establish a, how things should be now. I'll say, albeit all the, the Savior's area looked like it still had a little left to be desired. Yeah, and the, the sanctuary, I believe, was, it was completely gone. Yeah. So now there's the status of, okay, who's rebuilding what? Hilltop is now being ran by Maggie and company. They still have not addressed the final scene from last season's Mm -hmm. finale that is now pitting up for Rick versus Maggie. Yep. And what the direction they're going to go in. They were just kind of showing that there still is conflict going on between the groups and Negan is in his jail cell uh, still talking to Rick. So now after all this time, he's he's still in Alexandria Mm -hmm. and he's nothing really has changed there. But the biggest takeaway that I got from this trailer was we were introduced to the Whisperers. Uh Uh-huh. Which I've read Samantha Morton has been cast as Alpha. Ooh. So that has been the big news I have heard. And we did see a scene that was parallel to the comic Mm -hmm. where you see two people run um, over like an embankment and they're covering themselves in mud. Yeah. And you really have to listen to the audio because yeah. I will be honest, I did not catch it the first time. I'll say now that you're saying this, this, this does bring up my memory because I remember seeing the trailer the first time. I'm like, that looks really familiar. Yeah, I, I can't remember the issue number top of my head, but it was parallel to the comic. Like yeah, page okay. Page for page. Okay. And you hear somebody whisper, where are they? Uh-huh. And that immediately clicked. It was like, 
all right, they are going to do the whispers, which for me, a hundred times, yes. Right. That was kind of the ending I was hoping for the season, you know, that I hinted at before the, uh, this last season ended was that I was hoping, you know, there'd be some walkers and you'd hear somebody whisper because to me that would have been the greatest cliffhanger for a season finale you could have done. Because if you don't read the comics, this is all kind of brand new territory. Yeah. But if you have read the comics, you know what the whispers are going to be doing. Oh, Lord, nothing good. It's going to be nothing good. And it's going to be interesting now because Carl is not part of the show. Uh-huh. Who fills in that void or how they change the story to accommodate. Right. There's a lot going on there that we don't know as of yet. But it's going to be really interesting to see if they try venturing more closer to the books. Right. Or are they going to try forging their own path? Because... The last time they filed books, panel for panel, mm-hmm. was when they killed Glenoff. Yeah, we know how the internet reacted to that one. Yes. The regular readers of the comic, it was a normal day. Yep. For anyone who just follows the show and doesn't read the books, it was the worst day on TV in a long time. I would say, dare I say, the only comparison I can make is it was to Walking Dead readers as the Red Wedding was to Game of Thrones readers before that aired. Uh, yeah, I'd have to say that's pretty good. Accurate statement. So to see how they're going to go with this, I'm very intrigued. Mm -hmm. Because me personally, for the story's sake, I want to see the Whisper Saga play out. Oh, so do I. I don't want to see him hold anything back. No, please don't. No, because if you're going to introduce this group and they do a lot of bad things. Yeah, none of them good. I want to see if they're going to actually follow suit with the story. Now, like I said, they have to change one element now, especially with Carl not being yep. on the show. Yep. Can they find somebody to substitute in that role? Absolutely. There's no question of that going. But they need to figure out a way they're going to be able to do this. And if they're going to introduce them at the season premiere, how does this lead into the midseason finale? Because if the early rumor, and note how I stress rumor, is that Rick and Maggie are only going to be on until the mid-season finale. Are they going to have those two conflict uh, resolution and they're both wiped off the table by the time the Whispers show up? Or are the Whispers going to be working in the background and working their angles? I think what will happen is is you have the conflict between Maggie and Rick. It'll build to a breaking point where they might fight, they might not, they might get ready to fight, what have you. And then what I think will happen is in in that time, you'll start getting hints and and you'll start getting glimpses of the whispers and they'll have their own machinations and their own plans going on in the background. Who knows? They might even be stoking the fires Mm -hmm. of this potential feud. Uh, What I think will happen is you'll get to the mid season finale and you'll have, I don't know, uh, Denai Guerrero's character Michonne and Daryl go in the like middle of a fight, go wait or end of a fight and go wait. Where's Rick and Maggie? And they've, they're they gone and they're kidnapped. It could happen. I mean, there's got to be something that happens there because I know that unless Rick is going to leave for whatever reason and if they're opening the door for him to return, right? he just goes off into the sunset. Because I can see them doing a midseason cliffhanger where if a potential fight happens and you've got Michonne standing in a field or standing on a hill, wherever – and it's after the fight, there's bodies strewn all over the place, zombies, humans, and she's just standing there, you know, sword in hand, screaming, Rick, 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 and you hear it echo over mm-hmm. the distance, cut to black. That is a big cliffhanger. It would be something to see, and I think The Walking Dead definitely needs something like that. Right. Not to say that this last season was a disappointment, but I don't think All Out War really delivered. No, it, least, did, it didn't live up to our expectations. No, definitely not. I think it could have gone a lot different, a lot better, but it was still worth watching. Yeah, but still loved it. But. Yeah, but still, but it just it's nitpicking. Yeah. And I just like being extra critical. And it, for me, I like to see when the story follows the books to the letter. I mean, I, I, my perspective, and I know I've said this before, growing up with the Harry Potter books, I know the, the movies deviated from the books heavily. Uh, it doesn't always bother me when adaptations deviate from the source material but if i were given a choice between deviating and staying true i'd prefer to stay true i prefer to stay true but unless they really have a great take on it and for right. me I, I just felt like all that war was just kind of deflated a little bit mm-hmm. it's just like almost too much of a happy ending so to speak at yeah. the end so obviously with the whispers joining the show definitely want to see a little shake up and maybe get back to the uncertainty level that yeah. was with seasons one and like, two. Get back to the, oh, crap, there are some walkers coming up on them, not the, oh, hey, look, walkers. 
No, definitely not. So Walking Dead had a great panel, though, explaining the whole Andrew Lincoln thing. And going into the other D- TV show panels, I thought the CW had a great run this weekend. Yeah. No pun intended, considering we're going to be talking about The Flash. But I think every show that's involved in the Arrowverse, along with Black Lightning, I thought had great panels. Yeah. And from those panels that we saw, or the trailers that we saw, rather, which one really kind of stuck out to you that got you most excited, Pat? Uh, I'd probably have to say Arrow simply because they say in the trailer, at least what they show, he's been in jail for five months. He clearly is showing he's trying to keep things on the low, not cause any trouble, seeing as everyone knows the secret now. And on the outside, you know, they're trying to maintain status quo without him, which is kind of like what you saw in a couple episodes of Flash. But I think the other thing is you look at the mystery of, okay, who's this masked person running through? Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see what it's going to play out because there's just so much going on there that, you know, Oliver's in jail. There hasn't been a vigilante running through Star City. Looks like his vigilantes are now illegal, banned, whatever you want to say. Right. And now that you have somebody in there that is portraying Oliver Queen. Mm-hmm. We don't know who. The smart money is on Roy Harper. Yeah, to me, it's too easy. But it's too easy. I'm going to th- I threw this out on social media, and I know I definitely heard some static about it, but I'm going to stick to my guns about this. I'm going to say it's possibly Tommy Merlin. I, I'm agreeing with you because, to me, for it to be Roy, it's too simple. It's too easy. We know he's coming back. It's been announced he's coming back. He's going to be a regular. It's not going to be a one-off episode, and then he's gone. To me, it's too easy with that news, with that knowledge, to then introduce this mass vigilante. Ooh, who could he be? Oh, surprise, it's raw. No, it's too simple. Yeah, it's got to be somebody that's going to definitely throw a wrench into everything. Let's see, the other reason I'm excited for this uh, more so than the other ones is because Stephen Amell had a quote. I don't know if it was during the panel or during an interview that he basically said he wants people to hate Oliver several times this season. And I'm like, all right, after everything you've done, you're going to make him hate you even more? Well, I think it's needed that I really think that they want to inject something into the franchise. I mean, this is, what, season seven now? I believe so. The longest running Arrowverse show on the CW. When you get to this point, you really have to keep reinventing yourself. Mm -hmm. So what better way than to make the most beloved vigilante of all the CW into the most hated? Yeah. And I think there's a lot of different ways they can go with it. I know Ricardo Diaz is coming back yes. and bringing the Longbow Hunters, which is going to be different than the comics version. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see how they all play out. Like, uh, Cody Rhodes also returning. Yes, he is returning along with Vinnie Jones and a bunch of other villains that have been in the Arrowverse for many seasons. Uh huh. So it's really kind of interesting to see how this is all going to play out. Yeah. That going into season seven... They really have a lot to live up to, and they're really—I—I I think they really had the best trailer out of the Arrowverse shows. Mm-hmm. I thought Supergirl had a great trailer, and yeah. they just showed enough that it's—I don't know what storyline they're going to go with. To be they honest had, with you, they had me sold on Sam freaking Whitwer. Yes, is I believe he's Agent Liberty. Yep, if I'm not mistaken, and they're introducing a few other characters too. Um, Dreamer, which I believe is the first transgender superhero. Yeah, on TV, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so kudos to them for introducing that character onto the show. I thought that Legends of Tomorrow had a great panel, too. But their trailer, I I don't really know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm not meaning that in a bad sense. It's just, it's Legends. So you know it's going to be quirky. It's American Doctor Who. It looks like they go to the 60s in Woodstock, because I think, if if I'm not mistaken, I caught Jimi Hendrix at one point in that trailer. Yeah, they're... Their pop culture references for their time travel have been spot on, and I expect more of the same. I just really don't know what the villain is going to be this season. I, know I thought it was going to be Gorilla Grodd, or it sounded like him. Well, they they showed a lot of flashbacks from the previous season. Right, that's what kind of threw me with the trailer. Was like I was expecting some stuff and some hints of what this season was going to be, but then you go into the trailer and, oh, hey, there's, you know, college Barack Obama. And I'm like, wait a minute, wasn't that from last season? Yeah, they, they showed a lot from last season, and they showed a little bit from this season. And I know that now they're going to be dealing more with the demon world of the DCU. Oh, that's going to be awesome. With John Constantine being added to the team, you know it's going to be interesting television, mm-hmm. to say the least. Yep. And the Flash's trailer was interesting that they showed that uh, Barry and Iris' daughter, Nora, who they confirmed was XS, Mm -hmm. to my knowledge is a member of the Legion of Superheroes from the future, Uh is now part of the show and dealing with Cicada, 
who is was announced as Chris Klein, I believe, from the American Pie movies. Okay. He uh, Oz Striker. Oh, oh, yep, yep. He is going to be the major villain of the season, which they're not doing another speedster. I'm okay with that. I'll say that's it, although you. you it can be understand understood why you would think that, given the end of the trailer. Yeah, you could think that, but now there it's going to be interesting to see how this one plays out because, like I said, it's not another speedster, albeit though it's a very obscure yeah, villain of yeah. the Flash Rogues Gallery because I think the last time I, I heard wind of Cicada was Villains United, and that was years ago in the comic okay. series. So, okay. But correct me if I'm wrong, hashtag ODPHEE. Black Lightning had a strong trailer too. And overall, the DCU on TV looked very strong, but the most surprising element was in their joint trailer that they were doing. They were saying that Batwoman is coming. Yeah. Uh, Details have been kind of scarce other than you will see her at the mid-season crossover. Right, that was announced a couple of months ago, or that got out a couple of months ago, that she was going to show up. And, of course, we'd been speculating during all last season what was going on because in multiple shows, you had, you know, Wonder Woman got referenced, Superman got referenced, Batman got referenced. And they're like, all right, we're not name-dropping the big three without something going on. And then, of course, you get the news that Batwoman is going to be showing up in the crossover, and now it feels like it sounds like they're going to develop a show. Which I'm very excited to see. Super excited to see how they pull this one off. I It's going to be interesting to see how it spreads out across the CW because I know they're going to be expanding their programming one day to Sundays. Mm-hmm. So as long as there's room for all the shows to be on and nobody gets removed, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with it just as long as they don't do like they did last year where they're jumping what shows on at what time during different parts of the year. That was yeah. really confusing. Yeah, the Supergirl Legends of Tomorrow flip-flop was a little tough to kind of wrap your head around. It's like because you'd watch one show for a couple of months, pause, go to the other one, pause, go back. Yeah, there was just a lot of jumping around. But overall, the CW, I mean, they got some of their strongest shows on TV. Black Lightning is amazing. If you haven't caught up with that, this is a perfect time to start watching for the summer so you get ready for this fall return. Supergirl is turning a lot of heads, and they're taking a lot of growth next season too. So it's going to be interesting to see how that story plays out. Legends is always solid. Flash, they, they've they definitely rebounded from Season 3, mm-hmm. and it's going to be interesting to see where that story goes. And then Arrow, I, I tell you, I'm more excited about Arrow than I think of any of the other five shows on right now. Absolutely. So going with that, the only faux pas I would say, though, for TV-wise, had to be the Titans launch. Yeah. Now, this is going to be for the streaming service, the DC Universe, which is launching... Uh, I believe it's later this year. They're going to be doing a mix of live action shows. I know Swamp Thing was announced, Doom Patrol. They ha- did announce that Star Girl was going to be on the show uh-huh. or have her own show from the Justice Society. That is going to be a little interesting to see. So we don't have a lot of details from that, but we no. did see Titans. Uh, Pad, do you want to break it down? No, because it's hot garbage. It did not look good. So, and, and that's being polite. And, yeah, no. Now, granted, it's early. So we're not sure exactly what is going to happen, pray tell, with that. Uh, Albeit, though, the quote of the con had to be F Batman, which a very angsty, if I can use that word, Robin was yelling as he was going around beating up thugs in Gotham. Uh, Now, that wasn't Robin. That was the Punisher. It was just, it was seemed like it was ultra violent for what the Titans are used to being. Yeah. Portrayed. Now, I can understand going with a gritty look because the DC stuff is gritty. You can do Titans and be gritty without turning Dick Grayson, a character who has, who tries to have higher morals and stand on a higher ground than Batman himself shooting and stabbing people. That was kind of my biggest issue is you have, you know, because that was Dick Grayson. They don't show the, the, circus tent with the sign the flying graysons and that be jason todd that's not the case it's dick, it's dick grayson that was kind of my biggest issue was you know f batman which okay supposedly according to some of the folks from the show he's saying that because he's he's not working with batman anymore he's removed from batman okay sure if that's the excuse you want to go with fine but what i can't stomach and what i can't swallow is you know he beats up the thugs in the alley okay he stabs a couple of them Eh, in other circumstances, okay. And then he picks up a gun, and then, like, you know, Indiana Jones style, just boom, 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 boom. Yeah. It definitely was an interesting take. I know Jeff Johns was uh, interviewed talking about it, and to quote him, there's a story to be told with the series. Dick Grayson is really trying to find his new place in the world, a new spot in life, just like the other Titans are. They're all lost, and they're trying to 
find one another to form the surrogate family. That's a quote from him from Comic Con. Right. You know, honestly, like the take. I really want to see how it pans out. I really was not super excited about Titans no. after seeing this. Maybe if I see some more footage, maybe. But as of right now, I think that was probably the one downside of Con that I just I saw and I was like, really, like, yeah, not what I was expecting to see. And uh, and you know, maybe if I see some other trailers, maybe I'll start kind of swaying my opinion for it. But honestly, Titans did not wow me over. No, m- neither myself. Simply because. I wasn't 100% sold on the thing. I was an amp for the thing. I was cautiously optimistic about it just because I'd seen some photos of it and I wasn't 100% sold on the project, but I was willing to let, because it was like behind the scenes, they're not filming stuff. I was like, all right, that's not them on camera acting on a scene. I kind of wanted to wait until I saw a trailer. Saw a trailer, no, hard pass for me. Definitely. So overall, though, the TV shows really made an impact, good or bad. I know that the one that really stuck out to end the segment, we go quickly on a note, Iron Fist on Netflix. They did yep. have their panel. Yep. It did show kind of the fallout from Defenders and where he's going in his direction. They did announce Typhoid Mary is going to get added to the show. Mm-hmm. I thought she would be a better villain for Jessica Jones, but I'm excited to see that she has been added to the, yes. to the Defenders universe. And they did say that Steel Serpent is going to be the other villain. Mm -hmm. So to see where Iron Fist goes from here, it can only go up. I know that this was probably, in my opinion, one of the weaker shows on Netflix. Yeah. But it was just the writing. I had no issue with the acting, but I was excited to hear Daughters of the Dragons are going to be back. Mm -hmm. That it was going to implement more ties into the other Netflix shows. And I'm just wondering now, after seeing how Luke Cage ends, where Iron Fist is going, because the one thing he kept saying, this is my city to protect. Right. Um, and I'm hoping it's not turning into this season's, I'm Danny Rand. Hopefully not. I just think that they're going to really make an effort to really make this show work. And like I said, season one had a lot of potential, but I just think the writing, just to figure out who Danny Rand was, I think it just flip flopped from each episode and it just didn't really resonate too much with me. Mm-hmm. But overall, the TV shows had a pretty good outing at San Diego Comic Con. I thought the CW did a really good job, you know, showing their shows. Supernatural looked great too, by the way. And I don't want to get into that too much because going on 300 episodes, there's a lot of back history to go into. Yeah. But it it definitely looked good. Titans was the only one as a wait and see, but Netflix has another hit coming out with Iron Fist too, I believe. I got really high expectations for that. CW Arrowverse is doing a lot of big things, so we can't wait to see that. And The Walking Dead has got a lot to deliver on. But let mm-hmm. us know what you think. Hashtag ODPHEE. We're going to come back. You are listening to the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour Entertainment Edition. Hi, this is Mike C from I Am Horror. You're listening to the ODPH, the most killer podcast on the planet. Coming back for the comic segment on this week's San Diego Comic-Con recap on the ODPH Entertainment Edition, and there was a lot of news coming out. Oh, boy, just a bit. You would think. I mean, obviously, San Diego Comic-Con, it bears a lot of weight, but there was so much coming out. I tell you what, DC, like we said, we they crushed it on the movie aspect. Mm-hmm. They crushed it on the comic aspect. No doubt. And especially there is so much coming out on the black label that mm-hmm. we talked about a, f- a few episodes back, but... They did confirm Batman Three Jokers is coming out. Oh, boy. Which will finally, I, I guess, give us the definitive origin to the Joker. Uh, for now. For now, but I'm waiting to see how that pans out. There is also going to be a Mark Silvestri book doing Batman and the Joker as like a team-up. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, first and foremost, Silvestri's artwork is amazing. To, so to see him working on Batman and the Joker. I can only imagine how that's going to plan out. And I'm super, super excited to see that. There's also the announcement of Heroes in Crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, this is Tom King's new project he's working on that I will say will be arguably the most talked about comic book in the next year. Uh, Yes, it will be. Without question. And it's going to be dealing with... Uh, superhero trauma, that there is actually a place in the DCU where uh, heroes go to kind of deal with their PTSD. Mm-hmm. 
And it's the first time this has really ever been addressed in comics. Yeah. And especially it's going to be focusing with the DC Trinity, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman. But Booster Gold and Harley Quinn are going to play a prominent factor in the story as well. And just to see how it pans out, I believe that there is like a shooting at where these he- heroes are going to deal with their trauma issues. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of folds out from there. And if you've been reading Tom King's work, I know I speak highly about his Batman work, but his Mr. Miracle work right now has been top notch. I can't speak highly enough about that book. Right. So to see what he's going to do with this kind of story is going to be truly telling. Mm-hmm. And I think it's arguably it's probably the biggest one on my radar for the upcoming year. Yeah. Of I really want to see how this is going to be done because we've never seen anything done like this. No. Especially with big name superheroes. That how this is going to play out, I don't know, but I'm super excited to see where it goes. And I know with King, he's going to definitely handle the subject matter very tastefully and to see how this story transfold or folds out, I, I, I tell you, I'm just excited about it. I don't even think I can put it in proper words. So I'm super excited to see how that pans out. And DC was making a lot of moves with their books too. I know Kelly Sue DeConnick is going to be taking over Aquaman. I'm excited to see that. Jeff Johns, as we said before, when we were talking about Shazam, is going to be working on a new Shazam book. Yep. The biggest, I, I guess I was more puzzled and shocked by, move was Grant Morrison is going to be writing Green Lantern. Oh, boy. With, I believe, Liam Sharp doing the artwork. Now, if you've ever read Grant Morrison's work, he definitely has a lot of creative ideas. And to see what he's going to do now with Hal Jordan in the lead role, I've heard it's going to be basically law and order in space. Oh, boy. So, bum, bum. I yeah, I don't know what to expect from this book, but I think it's going to be one that fans are going to be talking about for a long, long time. Now, not to be outdone, Marvel did have some major announcements going on in their own right, but the biggest one had to be Chris Claremont is going to be taking over um, or coming back to the X-Men universe, and Mm -hmm. he's going to be writing the lead-in for X-Men Black, which I believe is a series of one-offs concerning the X-Men villains. Right. And I know he's going to be writing Magneto. I believe that there is four other villains that are to be named that are going to be having their own one-shots. But the biggest news that I think was coming out of this is they're restarting Uncanny X-Men. Yeah. That they're going to be canceling Blue and Gold, and they're going to be forming one X-Men book. So to see where that goes, I mean, I'm super excited to see. I know it's the 25th anniversary from the cartoon, Mm -hmm. and I know that you knew about some Spider-Man news coming out. Yeah, they're going to be doing a bit of a crossover big event thing with Spider-Man called Spider-Geddon. Which I'm interested to see what happens with that because I know they showed off a Uncle Ben Spider Man Spider Ham was there. Uh, it was, it, but anytime, of course, it's going to be following uh, Sp- into the Spider Verse and the events that happened with that. I'm just interested to see where this goes. The other thing I read that it was an idea that was pitched, but nothing ever came from it was uh, doing a Deadbolt comic where it's Deadpool with uh, Black Bolt's powers. Of course, you have the Merc with a mouth who can't shut his mouth with Deadbolt's powers, and his mouth is bolted shut. There's no way they would do that. <laughs> I mean, it, it's funny. It's it's it, really I, funny. I, to think, I heard but the idea floated out there by uh, somebody, and I want it to happen. It, you know what? It could be interesting. I mean, Marvel is right now, I know since they've done their switch at Editor-in-Chief, have been coming out with some really quality books. The Venom book has been really, really interesting mm-hmm. to watch. And I know the, the, the Immortal Hulk that has been coming out. I mean, you want to talk about horror comics. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really just a really creative take on the character. Mm-hmm. And especially now, I know Fantastic Four is due for their relaunch. I know Iron Man is did a reset after Brian Michael Bendis left to go to DC. Mm-hmm. And Spider-Man, as you've been reading, has been you know a really interesting start, which yeah. I know I talked about last episode, my thoughts on the Amazing Spider-Man reboot. Mm-hmm. And now I guess I can say a, a somewhat spoiler since I didn't want to get into it last week. With Peter and Mary Jane getting back together. Yep. I I'm I am all for this. Oh yeah, I think anyone who is a fan of Spider-Man would be. Uh 110%. I'm I'm all in on this. The MCU is not right. Well, excuse me, the Marvel comic universe is not right unless Peter and Mary Jane are together. Absolutely. And the whole omit storyline I I'm just I'm very fearful that they're going to somehow tie into that. I, I kind of want to see it get retconned mm-hmm. and just erased. So, yeah, I guess what they may have been married and you can kind of re-justify it and go from there because I have a feeling before it's all said and done, that's what's going to play out. 
I, I think they're going to do a reset, which as long as it's done well, I'm, I can get into. I can definitely get into. Yeah. If it's not done well, I'm going to be really ticked off. But I like Nick Spencer as a writer. I think he does some quality work. So you know what? I'm waiting to see how he goes with it. And I think lastly, the big news I heard is that Spider-Gwen is getting a name change to Ghost Spider. Okay. So and I believe that she is the character is due for a relaunch series coming out later this year too, which I'm super excited. I have never been the biggest Gwen Stacy fan, but I will tell you I'm a fan of Spider-Gwen. Right. And I, I, I love the book that has been out. So to see the character kind of get a redo – and I, I think the I think it's a better name than Spider Gwen. Yeah. So I'll take Ghost Spider, and to see where she goes from there, I'm definitely excited to see. But definitely let us know what you thought your, was the biggest comic book news of the weekend from San Diego Comic Con. Like I said, I thought DC had a great weekend, especially the Black Labels announcements that they had coming out, and Marvel definitely with their X Men news coming too. There's big moves coming down the entire comic book industry line, so if you're jumping into a book right now, it's a great time to be a reader. We're going to take a quick break. You are listening to the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour Entertainment Edition. Hey, this is Vince, the Cowan Man a local MMA fighter, telling you to keep on listening to the ODPH, the 607's up-and-coming newest podcast. Coming back for the final segment on this week's ODPH Entertainment Edition. And, Pad, you have some news before we get into one-shots? Yeah, we kind of got to address the elephant in the room. And I know you may be asking yourselves, you know, why are we waiting until this part in the show to address the James Gunn Disney news? That's because we felt we needed to give it its own sort of, you know, discussion, talk about it that wasn't paired up against anything else that had happened this uh, this, this past weekend because this did kind of put a downer, a, a black cloud, if you will, over the weekend that was San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, the news came down Friday afternoon that Disney had fired James Gunn from directing duties for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Now, this came not from Kevin Feige, the head of Marvel Studios, uh, but from Alan Horn, who is the president of Walt Disney Studios. Uh, the only person he answers to is CEO Bob Iger. So if you're thinking Family Tree, uh, this is pretty high on that tree. Uh, of course, you know, it was because of tweets he'd sent on his Twitter account from, I believe it was 2008 to 2011. You know, I think the thing that, you know, while what was said, you know, not good, you know, I realize there are some jokes and whatnot for certain places. Those, in my humble opinion, were not good in any way you can construe it. Uh, the thing I took away and the thing I was kind of left wondering, what does this mean for the movie going forward? Because he, of course, tweeted, I don't remember when, it was within the last couple weeks or months, uh, he had finished a first draft of the movie and had submitted it. So I kind of wonder what they're going to be doing with it going forward. Are they going to work with it and just make some changes or are they going to scrap it and start from square one? Of course, this also interesting part was he was, they were kind of going in a supposedly more cosmic direction with MCU stuff going forward. And he being a, you know, the director of the first two guardians movies was going to kind of oversee things a little bit. What does this mean for that? Who's to say? It's a tough situation, no matter what side you are on concerning this. That the tweets, albeit, were very questionable. And how Disney wants to do their business is completely up to Disney. You say that Disney is a publicly traded company. Yes. They do have shareholders. So, obviously, it is their call to make. Uh, whether you agree with their call or not is their call to make. And... How this impacts the Marvel Universe moving forward is it's going to be huge. Uh, we really don't have a clear picture of what's going to happen. And it's going to be something that we're going to just have to sit back and see what the next phase for Marvel is going to be, especially concerning the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise. Mm -hmm. That right now, I don't really have an opinion. No. Um, I really am just going to stick to the facts on this. That is, is Disney's call to make. That... Albeit they are the boss of Marvel Studios, and if they want to remove somebody because of their tweets, they have every right to. And 
pretty much that's all my opinion on it at this time. So going into the final one shots for the weekend, uh, you know me, I talk cloak and dagger on the show every week. And the big news for me was uh, season two has been green lit for next season. And the promo art has, is going to be mayhem. Ooh. If you've heard previous episodes of the show, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So obviously they were setting up for that this episode to give you a very quick recap because I know you've been very patient with us as we've been recapping San Diego Comic-Con, and we thank you for your patience, that has been really focusing on the fallout from Tandy and Tyrone saving Ivan and revealing about the that there is a safe deposit box that there's some information on, that Tandy is really kind of stepping her game up about finding out more information to take down Roxanne to avenge her dad. Ty, at this point, though, has really moved in to take out take out uh, Detective Connors, and he has established that he is wearing his cloak and using his powers to haunt Connors into a confession, which he does get. Dagger, on the meantime, sneaks into Roxxon to confront Scarborough and to really kind of address, you know, their issues. Connors does confess to the killing of Ty's brother, and O'Reilly arrests him. And Tandy basically traps Scarborough. It works to get a confession, but it doesn't get one, but there's a definitive warning sent. And then as the episode ends, O'Reilly name drops that she has a friend in New York named Misty, being one Misty Knight. Mm. So we finally have a connection between the Netflix universe and the uh, TV universe. I don't know how you want to call it. Traditional TV universe, I guess. However you want to call it for the Cloak and Dagger universe. About time. So there is finally a connection between all the shows. So this isn't like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. where, oh, yeah, so-and-so knew the Avengers. No, this is now actually, I'm not going to say you're going to see a crossover, but the door is now open. So as this is going on, this is also the same day as the anniversary of when they got their powers. Dagger sees a very unsettling image of her dad going into her mom's mind to to see that maybe not everything was exactly picture perfect concerning him and his actions. And then the final scene of the episode is O'Reilly comes home to find her boyfriend murdered. And now you know that there's basically going to be some reaction going on concerning O'Reilly helping Cloak or arrest Detective Connors. So going into that, there's only a couple of episodes left. Free form, Thursday nights, 8 o'clock. And definitely season two has been um, a go, so they're going to be working on that going forward. Pat, what you got for one shots? I got two things. Uh, first off, uh, recommendation, a uh, book coming out this week, uh, Star Wars Thrawn Alliances. I know I've talked about it before. This, of course, was the book that was announced by Star Wars legendary author Timothy Zahn at New York Comic Con last year. This was one that they uh, he announced it. They showed off a cover. I yelled out loud because I was that excited for it. Uh, he did a little bit of talking about it at a Star Wars books panel at San Diego Comic Con this past weekend. Uh, the book is going to play out in two separate timelines. One during the Clone Wars uh, animated series between season five of the Clone Wars and Revenge of the Sith uh, with Anakin, Thrawn, and Padme. And then the other is with Thrawn and Vader between the last two seasons of Rebels. I'm very interested to see this because Vader is a no-nonsense, you know, force choke you, get it done type of uh, villain, whereas Thrawn is the more methodical, four-dimensional chess. I'm nine steps ahead of you. So I'm very interested, especially when you tie a character like that into the Clone Wars or anything into the prequels. I'm very interested to see what it does because I feel like it just fleshes out any past stories that it could have any connections to. Other one, this was the one that I was most excited for that came out from San Diego Comic-Con, Star Wars The Clone Wars is coming back. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. This was so out of left field. Of course, there was a uh, 10th anniversary panel for Star Wars The Clone Wars, and they were billing this as, oh, it's can't miss. And, of course, you know, a lot of the main actors were there. Ashley Eckstein, who plays Ahsoka, was there. Matthew Lanter, who plays uh, Anakin Skywalker, was there. James Arnold Taylor, who plays Obi-Wan, was there. You know, the guy who voices Yoda was there. It, 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 there were a whole lot of people. And that, so they just dropped it. That, oh, we're not done. Mm. We're doing another season, which all of Star Wars fans went bonkers for and it's coming to uh the disney streaming service in 2019 date to be announced but i've already uh started my rewatch because i was already getting an itch to rewatch a series it's been a while this just pushed me over the edge 
Yeah, anybody that knows Pad, obviously, if his nickname is Padawan, you know he's in the Star Wars and the Clone Wars. <sighs> Read about it. He's he's all amped up for this. I, it's going to be so good. Yeah, I, I can fully imagine when it comes back, you're going to be hearing probably a whole show devoted to the Clone Wars. Quite possibly. Quite possibly. So my last one shot to end this week is Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. had their panel, and Clark Gregg has been announced directing the season premiere. Good for him. We have not heard anything else coming out from this season other than I believe Jeff Ward was added as a series regular yep. as Deke. Yep. So... Going forward, who knows what's going to be the future for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but their, our their favorite director is going to be directing the season premiere. Let's say if I can do a bit of fan predicting, uh, last shot of the season series, uh, them all sitting on a beach in Tahiti. Possibly. Or is this going to be the lead into the Disney streaming service? Uh, more likely that one. We'll see. But, folks, we have given you so much to talk about. San Diego Comic-Con delivered on all the hype, so... We can't be more excited about bringing some more news to you as soon as it develops. We just had some teaser trailers for movies, TV, comics, video games. We didn't even really get into that, but the Spider-Man 4 game. Oh, my God. PS4 well, game. The PS4 game looks amazing. Looks amazing. And everything's spinning out of that. Dragon Ball Super looked awesome, too. There's so much we can just make a whole second episode about, but hit us up on that social media. We'll dig into a little bit more. Hashtag ODPHEE. That's all we got for this week. So for Padawan J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Kenem. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour Entertainment Edition. We'll see you next time. (laughs) 